Hi. Oh my God, I'm so loud. I'm so loud. Did you have a good lunch? Yeah? Half asleep? Something like it? Okay, let's start. Let's start with a question. Who of you remembers what you were doing on the 14th of December 2004? You do? What were you doing? Picking up your puppy, congratulations. <laughs> I was not picking up my puppy and I have no particular reason to remember this date. If it weren't for the fact that, in fact I had to go and look it up. Uh, if it weren't for the fact that at the time I lived in California and I used to drive, you know, you drive everywhere there, as is cliche, I was driving back to the office from dropping off my daughters at school. And I had just returned from maternity leave. And I had this big pile of DVDs. Remember DVDs? <laughs> Actually, it might have been even VHSs, even, even worse, on um, the seat of my car. And while I'm driving, I was, I was quite cranky about the fact that a good half of the movies that I had with me had not had time to watch which is understandable, you know, when you have little kids and you return to work, you tend to be slightly overwhelmed. But as I was driving and as I was bemoaning the fact that I would have to either re-rent or be stuck with paying late fees, something came on the radio and it was a Blockbuster. So these were from Blockbusters. They were announcing that on January 1st, 2005, they would do without late fees. Uh, and I was like super happy on one hand because I cannot tell you how many hundreds of dollars I paid in late fees at the time, but I was also really cranky because I still, it still would take me years before I could see this. So everybody around me was talking about vodka tonics and Suntory times and I had no clue what they meant. It took me years to catch up. Anyway, so as I said, I was angry on 14 December 2004. Someone else was really angry too and that person was this gentleman, Reed Hastings, who, whose name you might not know but you all probably know his what he created or just around that time. He got really upset over a $40 late fee bill that he got from, from Blockbuster and started Netflix. Now, because we don't live under a rock, you all know how that ended up. It ended up a little bit like this. With Netflix, um, if we carried this line to today, it would be around a 5,500% growth, 5,500% growth, and Blockbuster in 2002 uh, started its decline, and right now it would be an absolute flat line. And what is interesting, I mean, both companies had very similar business models. Uh, but they have very different outcomes. And what is interesting to me is that Netflix very intentionally designed themselves, designed their organization for survival. They created a, a structure and processes and, and a clearly a technical infrastructure that allowed them to evolve with the environment that they were situated in. So for me, the, the big question is, why does this happen? And who is it happen with? We were chatting right before, uh, right during lunch. Uh, everybody loves to talk about fail transformations. Uh, and the stories of successful transformations are very scarce. Uh, and I believe it is because we don't look enough at the mistakes that we make. So I want to take you through a really quick transformation story. 
But before I do this, I'd like to know how many of you, please raise your hands, are now working in a transformation program? Uh, good number. For everybody else who did not raise their hands, don't worry, you will, eventually. It's an, it's an absolute promise. So, remember these? Film canisters, right? How many of you use a camera with film these days? A couple of people? That dates you, by the way. Um, you're a millennial. Well, it's vintage, it's coming back, isn't it? <laughs> so, we don't use this anymore. Um, and in fact, Kodak, who was the foremost manufacturer of film, you know, they were in the business of film photography, is now known primarily because their iconic Instamatic has become the logo of Instagram. They ripped off the logo, they, they ripped off the shape, they ripped off the name. But Kodak as a company is really not one of the brands that jump to mind when we think about photography. The really interesting thing about uh, Kodak is that they started looking at digital photography a long time before digital photography was a thing. So one of Kodak's biggest buyers was started hearing about digital photography and asked Kodak if they had to worry, if they had to prepare. And Kodak very thoughtfully decided to commission a study. This was happening in the 70s, so digital photography didn't become a thing until the late 90s. Uh, so this study was commissioned um, in the early 80s by the then uh, chief of uh, markets and, um, and marketing. And the study came back with two pieces of information, you know, classical good news, bad news. So the bad news was that digital photography was a thing and it was there to stay. The good news was that Kodak had a lead time of 10 years to prepare for the advent of digital photography. Unfortunately, internally, as it, as it happens in our organizations these days, when we talk about what someone in, the start, in a startup space is doing, the internal reaction was like, ah, that's cute, we do film. And so Kodak stuck with film as their business model. However, they did think about how they could develop this newfangled digital thing. In fact, they were the first manufacturer of electronic and digital camera, and this was what they created. It was the advantage. They had an immense uh, investment. Uh, I believe it was about $5 million, $50 million at, at the time. So they created these um, Kodak Advantix, um, which has this really lovely preview screen that, however, allows you to see your shot right after you took it. So it's heavily relying on film. And you know, one of the biggest drawbacks of film is that you cannot see the shot while you're taking it, so you cannot adjust it. Needless to say, Kodak flopped the, in the digital space, and we all know what happened. Eventually, they ran kind of out of business, either, uh, other than for the people that are aficionados that are still buying parts and still buying whatever film they can find. This phenomenon, is actually not as complex to or complicated to explain as one might think. And we can uh, use mathematical principles to explain why this happened. So if you're not familiar with the concepts of local optimum and global optimum, local optimum is the optimum means optimal, uh, is the best solution among all neighboring solutions. So Kodak had a problem, and they looked for the solution in the vicinity of the problem space in which they were operating, where global optimum, while oftentimes unachievable, is the best solution among all possible solutions. It doesn't matter whether they're near or far, they're just the best solution possible. Now, uh, what what I just described is effectively the difference between transformation and optimization. So we have, we're all part, those of us who work in transformation 
programs have probably realized that what we do under the guise of transformation is actually fiddling with what we have, digitizing the business. So we limit the scope of what we can do because we limit the space in which, uh, in which you can operate by saying, oh, we want to make this a little bit better. And the reality is that making things a little bit better makes a lot of sense, especially if you work in corporate type of environment. Reed Hastings, the Netflix guy, said this, said, process brings seductively strong near-term outcomes. And if you think about it from a transformational point of view, this is incredibly powerful insight. Think about how we measure things. Think about how optimizing a thing allows you to create a roadmap. It allows you to create a backlog. It allows you to chart a path that then can be measured. And guess what? If you're in corporate, those measurements mean bonuses, means pay rise, um, increases, they mean uh, career mobility, they mean all these kind of things. Transformation is uncharted territory. So how can you measure something that you still don't know what it looks like? And the reality is that our traditional management techniques don't really help us as well. So we tend to hire, when we think about a smart person that we want to bring in our teams, we think of the MBI. And someone with an MBA is not evil by any stretch of imagination. They're not, um, they're not uh, incapable, quite the opposite. They have a whole lot of knowledge that they bring to the table. But they also bring traditional management techniques that rely heavily on these processes that hinder us and that make us firmly remain in the optimization space as opposed to putting us in the real transformational space. And this is not because companies don't care about their people. It's not because companies don't care about their customers. Quite the opposite. Kodak cared very, very much about photography. They cared very much about quality. They had, they, I'm sure that they cared a lot about their employees as well. But the thing is that as organizations get bigger, they also become much more risk averse. They have more responsibility. They have responsibility towards stakeholders. They have responsibilities towards an increasing workforce. And that risk aversion stifles innovation, stifles real transformation, and stifles uh, learning, which is exactly what you end up getting in the process of transforming. And as I was saying, organizations aren't evil. Uh, organizations aren't bad. The certainly the people in organizations aren't. But if you look at history, if you look at what's been done, you realize that we go through patterns and we follow archetypes. And I say we because I, I too work in a very large organization that I will not name. Um, so we, we tend to rely on archetypes. And, and you see these cycles. You'll recognize this cycle as things that you might have gone through. So the first one, when we're like, oh my god, there's pressure from the market. The, the fintechs or whatever it is are coming at us and they're going to take all of our customer base and our business away from us. The first thing that we do is we bring in the charismatic CEO the knight in shining armor that is going to rescue us from ourselves. We all know how this turned out, right? It did not make anything great again. And I can say it because I have an American passport, so uh, I, can, I can say that. The reality is that someone that comes from the outside, someone that doesn't have the domain expertise and the deep knowledge that people in the organization or the people that operate in that space is going to come in, is going to make some interventions, is going to go for the populistic approach, but very rarely is going to be able to rescue the organization from itself. 
the reality is that most organizations need rescuing, but not from themselves, and we'll look at that. Then when this fails, we say, oh my god, everybody else has an innovation lab. Let's have an innovation lab. So what we do is we follow what Lockheed did during the war uh, the, um, with their Skunk Works team. We take money and toys and people and we chuck them in a room in a corner and we tell them, make us something that is going to be transformational. And again, you take people, it doesn't matter how brilliant they are. Uh, you could put St Stephen Hawking in a room and give him all the robots and all the artificial intelligence on this planet. And still, if he doesn't understand the domain space, he's going to make maybe a good thing, but it's not going to be the thing that um, is going to resolve the issue. And the reality is that innovation labs, the way they are structured at the moment, completely separate from the context in which they should coexist, are a little bit like Milli Vanilli. They're one-hit wonders. If they have a good idea, it's by chance and it's not a repeatable or scalable uh, framework. And then there is the third savior. And I apologize in advance to all the consultants in the room. We bring in the consultants. And it's not that the consultants are necessarily bad. In fact, like MBAs, consultants are very, very good at what they do. But much like the two prior examples, they come in, they have their methods that have been developed in complete abstraction from the context in which they are um, to be deployed. They study the problem generally in a room. They send all of their notes overnight to Bangalore or wherever it is that they send them. And they come back in the morning in the form of uh, PowerPoint decks. And they chuck specifications or chuck instructions at the workforce. When the consultants leave, what happens is that the knowledge goes with them. It doesn't stay in the organization at all. The, the, the consultancy model is also interesting because I think it addresses a fundamental problem that organizations perceive, which is that of risk management. Uh, the reality is that if I hire, and I don't want to name any of the big four, five, six, but if I hire the same consultancy that has operated in a different similar organization to mine, if the program doesn't work, my personal responsibility is very different from what it would be if I had hired a smaller consultancy that nobody knows, that I know to be absolutely awesome, but that doesn't have the same pedigree. And so we keep going through these cycles. And if you think about your own organizations, probably this is something that you, uh, you, know, you recognize, that you, you can relate to. And as I was saying, organizations are full of incredibly smart people. But we keep doing the same thing over and over. And it is inevitable that we ask ourselves, why does this happen? Why do we keep doing the same thing over and over? Now, the gentleman who, uh, have you all read Thinking Fast and Slow? Okay, very few hands. If you suffer from insomnia, I recommend it. It's a really good book, but it's very, very dense. It's super interesting. And Daniel Kahneman, who is a psychologist and who studied organizations, talk about how, as human beings, we have two modes. He calls them system one and system two. And um, we, as, as conscious being and conscious professionals, we like to think that we operate in system two, which is slow and conscious and deliberate, and we think about our actions and uh, we, you know, with deep care. The reality is that we spend, um, so system two, in addition to be very uh, thoughtful and deliberate, it's also incredibly effortful. If I had to think about every single thing that I do, you know, it's very stressful for your body too, not just your mind. 
this, my moving on the stage would be like, now I'm gonna move my left foot and then the right foot and I'm gonna move my hand for emphasis and I'm gonna take a breath. I get anxiety just thinking about it. The reality is that we're often in what he calls system one or cognitive ease, which is automatic, it's unconscious. You know, I don't need to think about moving. I, and often time, I don't need to think about the things that I do because I know I've done them before. It, it's what we call autopilot. But this being in system one also creates biases um, and it, it enables us or it puts us in a position of reacting on the back of information that we know and adapt them to our circumstances. So if I know that Julie started reading by herself at age four, I'm going to infer that she's a very smart young woman. And so when I am asked to project what her GPA might be, I'm gonna assign a higher value on the back of that, on the back of that information. Now, if we combine this mode of being and thinking with all of the traditional management theories, we're gonna go in, in McGregor's territory. So McGregor was an organizational psychologist that came up with what he called theory X and theory Y. And he developed it on the back of an experiment that he did with managers, where he asked managers to listen in to um, other managers' meetings. So if you subscribe to Theory X, which is based on inferences, on heuristics, you're gonna think that people are a cost to be monitored and controlled, that work should be segmented, and that technology is used to control humans. It's a little bit what we, of what we call micromanaging. If you, if you instead believe that people can be trusted, that can enjoy the work, that we can create conditions that are conducive to people on doing their best job, you're gonna have very different results. But because we are primed to adapt notions to our own circumstances, we end up climbing these, what is called the ladder of inference, where we take reality and facts, this transformation program failed, this agile implementation didn't deliver the things that we want, we select some of these facts, the ones that are relevant to us, and then we interpret them, we make assumptions, we jump to conclusions, and those conclusions become the beliefs that then drive our actions. Now, when you apply this type of thinking to humans, you realize how good old Maslow, when he was talking about his um, um, hierarchy of needs, in reality, uh, you know, was talking about some very sophisticated uh, concepts. And theory X doesn't really fit with his view of the fact that as human beings, once we've taken care of the basics of what we need to feel safe and to feel accomplished, then have a higher need to realize themselves. So if you abstract this, uh, if you take these fairly abstract concepts and bring them to your organizational reality, you realize that a lot of the times you stay say, firmly in this space that you, know, you take care of safety. You know, you need, we, need, we all need a salary to pay bills. Uh, uh, we, and we, of course we take care of our physiological needs, but we get immensely frustrated. We get immensely bored. We, get, we start thinking about our next move because we are not self-realized. And the reality is that work is a fairly natural side. You know, maybe you don't, we don't have to love everything that we do every day in the office, but work is, um, is actually as natural as, as play for humans. We, ha we are primed to be busy. And if you've never read these, <coughs> these um, Robert Townsend's um, graphic novels, Up the Organization, I recommend that you do because um, it talks fairly, uh, in, a, in, in a very lovely way about this, about humans need to create to do it in order to have meaning and find purpose. So this situation is, the, the picture that I'm, that I'm painting is pretty bleak. 
And it becomes even bleaker if you think that we don't work on assembly lines. So all these theories, all the, the, the modern management techniques were developed at a time when people worked in factories. They sat all day making rivets or bags or um, looking at punch cards. We were knowledge workers. All of us here are knowledge workers. That means, this is a term that was coined by Peter Drucker and, um, you know, who has this really interest, fascinating sort of dual respect from two apparently very different communities, the design community and the management community. And he talks about knowledge work as work that is non-deterministic in nature. Non-deterministic for those who are not familiar with the term, and I apologize if I come across as pedantic, means that when we start working, we don't necessarily know the outcome of what it is that we're gonna be working on. And it's not just non-deterministic, it is heavily based on research, which is a primarily psychological activity. And it's highly independent and uh, sometimes unregulated. And to make things even worse, we're not just knowledge workers, we are knowledge workers that work in complex adaptive systems, which by their own nature are non-deterministic. And this is where I think the, in the complexity and in the non-deterministic nature of the spaces we move in that I think the greatest opportunities for successful transformations are. I'm not gonna give you a recipe, but I'm gonna share some thoughts. But to go back to systems for, for a second, um, systems are, are interesting because even when you think about computer systems, and we're not in a computer system, we are in what is called a socio-technical system, the property of the system, so what the system does, is not done by, is not produced by the sum of the parts of the system. Rather, it is the product of their coming together. So this room right now has certain properties because of all the different elements, meaning the people and the furniture and the light coming in. This is what is co we call the emergent property of a system. If one or two or three or 10 of you leave, the property of the system will change. Same thing if all of a sudden there is a, a thunderbolt, out, um, a thunderstorm outside, or if 100 people were to come in, the properties of this system would drastically change. And um, ACOF, I saw Dr. Demings on a screen earlier and my little black systems thinker heart kind of like was very happy, did a little dance. Um, Dr. Uh, Akoff actually uh, said this very eloquently um, and even more so, he, so he talks about emergent properties of systems, he talks about how you know, they're determined by all the parts coming together, but he talks about something else that's incredibly important. Let's just take a simple example. I read the New York Times recently that 457 different Now we'll have an automobile consisting of all the best parts. What do we get? You don't even get an automobile. For the obvious reason that the parts don't fit. The performance of the system depends on how the parts fit, not how they act taken separately. This is powerful, isn't it? And it becomes even more powerful 
when we bring this kind of thinking, this concept of fit into our systems, the systems of people that we operate in. So I assume that at least some in the crowd will have what we call line management responsibilities. And if you work in a large organization, you know that when you think about the projects that are coming, the work that you have to do, you always want the best talent, right? When you go out to hire, it's always the best candidate that you want. And then we take all these best people and we chuck them into a system, effectively into a team, into, into a business unit, into whatever, and we expect that they work like the best machine made by the best part. Guess what? It ain't gonna happen. We do other things when, uh, you know, when we manage people. So we, we, you know, we talk about them in very specific, you know, in, in, in very deliberate and specific way. We say that people are assets. We say that talent is where it all begins. That we need to win a war. And that, this is my favorite, that leadership matters most than leaders. So we take all these best people and we chuck them into these organizations and then we realize that, oops, we need to make sense of this. We need to make order. You know, we need to attribute line management, if you will, responsibilities. And so we make sense of these systems by drawing them out a little bit like this, right? And the thing that strikes me about these type of organizations, but hey, these are all the best people. But you see that all the best people at the top, they're very happy. And then as soon as you start going down, actually, not quite so much. And that is because here we're thinking about all the best parts. This is how the parts fit. And we never, ever, ever think about this. We never think that, uh, I'll share, I'll share the, the slide and I'll tell you where I got it from. We never really think that fit is a lot more important than structure. If you look at the lines, they've all changed. But so, because we, we only see that first picture and we only really think about that, that first picture, then we, you know, we, we, we think about the potential. After all, we have all the best people, right? And then we think about performance because that's what matters, we gotta deliver. And of course we focus on, you know, on that quadrant, high potential, high performance, and we tend to leave these people out here in the corner. We say, ah, they don't really matter. Well, if we hire the best people and then we can see their potential and we think that they're not performing, why were the best people in the first place? So we go back to the consultants and we ask them, well, what should we do with all these people that we now have? And the consultants will come back and tell us, this is what you need to focus on. You need to focus, of course, on the C-suite. You need to focus on leadership. And then of the whole employee pyramid, you just focus on the high potential. And the thing is, if that's where we focus, if that's what we keep in our organization, we end up with the equivalent of a sports team that's just made of goalies. If we only hire goalies, and they are the best goalies, who's gonna score? So, there's another, there's another byproduct of um, hiring people all of the same cloth, uh, cut of this, out of the same cloth and that are the best and that are high potential, is that the flow of information is pretty homogenous. The thinking is pretty homogenous. And the reality is that we should look at our organizations as, you know, we look at learning organizations. So places where it's not all only about 
success, it's primarily about learning because learning is what allows us to move into that global optimum, into it allow us to sort of like melt the fear away and deal with ambiguity and the what we call the unknowns unknowns in a much more nimble and flexible way. And you know, I'm really lucky to be operating in a space where we are talking a lot about creating a learning organization. We are talking a lot about employing what we know has worked and has, hasn't worked to our systems of people. You know, we have a huge systems thinking uh, group that doesn't just, isn't just about making control charts or system maps. I mean, they do that as well but it's primarily about the core function of systems thinking, which is you know, promoting learning. We talk about, in startup world, we talk about failing fast. I mean, I don't care about the speed at which you fail. What I care about is that you learn something from your failure, that out of that, you have, you develop uh, some additional knowledge. And, and that knowledge is what allows us to evolve and generally it's funny because generally it is knowledge that yes comes from the outside but is very much resident on the on the inside and then I think about something else you know we think about organizations as you know like this big corporate monolith they don't have a personality you know they have visions and mission statements but we rarely rarely think about purpose. The reality is that our organizations, every organization, even the, the, the dullest, most backwards one, has intentional foundations. There, there was an idea, there was a purpose, there was something that we, you know, that at some point was called a goal. That was what allowed for that reality to become, you know, to, to materialize. And so if you think about intentions, if you think about learning, if you think about people and knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. You can, you know, you have to have a Venn diagram. So you can look at the organizational goals or intent, and you can look at what the individual goals are. So self-actualization, producing good things. And because people are organizing teams then, or groups, then you look at the goals for those sub subsystem of the larger systems. And it's where these things meet that the magic really happens. So the question becomes, can you create an organization where this is possible, where learning takes place, where fit is considered? I think, I think it is possible, but I also think that it requires an enormous amount of courage. And there have been tremendous studies that have been done uh, or you know, numerous studies that have been done in this space. One of the most recent and one of the ones that I, that I find a bit radical, especially for Europe, but, but not impossible, is the deliberately developmental organization. It, it's, um, it was presented in a book that came out from HBR Press last year called uh, An Everyone Culture and written by two organizational psychologists, Keegan and uh, Leahy. And it talks about organizations where you have aspirations, the edge, what we call you know, the innovation, how do we move forward, how we grow. You have homes, so communities for the development of people. And then groups where the work actually happens, where you have regularity and process improvement, et cetera, et cetera. So where all the elements of tradition and um, innovation can come together to support a meaningful transformation. And even those psychologists that made, so in, um, that made those pyramids of uh, you know, talent, remember, that you had to focus on, eventually have come to realize that the focus is a lot less on the structure, on the organizational, um, on the corporate uh, um, culture as, as an entity, but the focus should be on the people and what they can uh, and what they can bring. So, if you look at leadership as 
what is needed for transformation as opposed to management, uh, Dave Ulrich actually came up with these five rules, shape the future, make things happen, uh, engage today's talent, build the next generation and invest in yourself that are focused very much on development and learning for the individual in order to drive change. And as you can see, they are mapped on an axis of, um, you know, uh, strategic to operational, axis of time, organization, individual, and the focus. Uh, I will share all of this. Dave Ulrich also came up with this really interesting uh, equation that he calls the equation of talent that, um, that I think is worth mentioning because we're running some experiments in that space and we're seeing some really positive uh, or encouraging movement. So he created this um, equation of talent and he says, because we talk of talent so much, talks about talent as being the product, product, not sum, of competence, commitment, and contribution. So having the right person in the right place at the right time with the right skills, uh, work that is meaningful, so not just necessarily making something out of context, but what I find super interesting is this employee value proposition. So work is a transactional exchange, but without commitment, that transactional exchange remains just that, transactional. So how can we evolve our organizations um, intentionally, with the same intention that contributed to creating them? Uh, there's a friend of mine, he, he runs a consultancy called Agile Reloaded in Italy. They're, they work in big corporate that came up with yet another canvas, except I quite like this canvas because its purpose is um, to self-destroy. He calls it the talent conversation, the talent canvas or the conversational canvas. And you know, it's got all the usual boxes that you would expect. But if you map this along the same axis of that leadership DNA, so the, from public to um, you know, more individual and and from the, looking at the individual and the organization, so public domain, more private, where you need trust. And you consider the individual, so the autonomous element of the system and the systemic nature of the role, you can use your hindsight, so what do you know about the individual and the foresight, what do you, what you know about what needs to be done that's part of the system to develop insights that will allow you to propel the organization to do that transformation from within. And so I took Dave Ulrich's talent equation and I mapped it over Marco's canvas. And we're having conversations on the back of that and then this data, this knowledge allows us to, I don't wanna say deploy because deploying people sounds uh, kind of utilitarian, people are not things, but to help people be situated where they can affect the most change, where they can have the impact that helps the organization move in a different direction. And we, you know, we end up resulting with a team that's not just goalie, but it's a full team, and a team that can deliver meaningful change and win, ultimately. I mean, victory is always relative. So to conclude, to quote my good friend Dana Chisnell, who works for the uh, US government, this to me is the key of transformation, making context for people so that they will be invested and they will not check out. And if there are things that, you know, I would, I would, uh, invite you to consider when you're thinking about your role in the transformation program or when you go and consult on a transformation program or even if it's not a transformation program, it doesn't really matter. I, I would suggest that you think about the fact that everything is connected and is part of a system. We cannot innovate in isolation. That doesn't happen. It has to be in context. That talent, diversity, is good, you want different perspectives. 
that transparency is fundamental. Creating that context and making it visible is what people and organizations need in order to be able to change and to stay on that learning curve. That, foster, uh, that continuous learning needs to be fostered, needs to be, needs to be valued. And that we need to learn to measure what matters and do that sensibly and not just focus on those short-term things. But the, if there is just one thing that I would like you to take away, is that all the things that we know about transformation are right, and all the things that we know about transformation are wrong. The only thing that is key is humans. Thank you.